Yeah, so everyone, good morning. Good morning. Morning. So much enthusiasm, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> it's the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Uh, we are coming here from Seoul in South Korea. My name is Keith, and I'm going to be talking soju with people who know soju more than I do. I just know how to drink it and I drink it very well. I know a little bit about it, but not as much as the people we have here today. So we just gotta be diving into Soju and just the general Korean scene at the moment on what we are doing with the most consumed spirit in the world. They drink a lot of it here in Korea, so they know a lot about it. So we're gonna have Douglas Park with us today who knows how to make the stuff and sell the stuff and the legalities of the product itself. And we got Julia Mello, who is just an expert in everything Korean in terms of the liquor, the industry, and just seeing the changes. And then we've got the dynamic duo of Demi and Sean. These guys are using soju in ways that it's never been used before and they know where it's going. So I'll pass on to Julia first, so she can just make a little quick intro about herself. Over to you, Julia. Awesome, okay, thanks, Keith. First off, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, wax lyrical about Korean alcohol in general. Uh, I'm Australian and I've lived in Korea for 15 years and I'm a specialist in Korean traditional alcohol. Um, so I've been studying and researching Seoul, which is the word for all, all types of Korean alcohol, for about 10 years. And uh, my company is a company for promotions and education, but also I am a, an instructor for fermentation and distillation for Korean traditional techniques. Um, so my company is called the Seoul Company. Uh, and basically we do everything and anything to help uh, further the cause of letting people know about how amazing Korean alcohol is uh, and where it's going in the future. So I'm really excited to be here to talk about um, pretty much my favorite thing. <laughs> so that's me. Uh, maybe if somebody else wants to go ahead and introduce next. Thank you very much, Julia. And I think moving on, we're gonna be introducing Mr. Douglas Park. He's uh, one of the leaders in the industry of craft soju at the moment. And their product, I can tell you, magnificent, <laughs> tastes fantastic. Over to you, Douglas. Uh, thank you, Keith. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Douglas Park. I'm the CEO of uh, Toki Soju. It's a small craft uh, brand here in Korea. Um, we actually started in Brooklyn, but um, we moved our production uh, two years ago to Korea, and we've been producing here locally. Um, yeah. Glad to be here. There you are, the man, Mr. Douglas Park, a man of few words and a lot of actions. <laughs> Moving on, we're going to be introducing Mr. Demi and Sean Kim. I think they were just bounce of each other. Owner of a contemporary Korean bar called Zest here in Seoul. Uh, focusing on a lot of uh, Korean produce, they're uh, making cocktail with it. And I can tell you, I can vouch for that, the cocktails are world-class indeed. Over to you, Demi and Sean. Hi everyone, my name is Demi, the founder of Jest. Thank you for the, this opportunity. <laughs> hey, I'm co-founder of Zest, uh, same as Demi. Uh, it's a great honor to be invited here and really happy to have a nice talk to you. <laughs> welcome, <laughs> Debbie, yeah, and yeah, welcome, yeah. Sean. So, that's, that's everyone, everyone who's, who's going to be taking part. Myself, I work in a hotel bar called Chaos A here in Seoul. And uh, we try to utilize a lot of Korean ingredients as well, but not as much as uh, everyone else who's here does. So we'll probably start off with an open question in terms of what does soju mean to everyone? Because I think around the world, if you hear soju, most of the things you think of is probably the green bottle, a famous green bottle everywhere. That is almost a symbol of soju now. 
throughout the world. So I'll just open on this question. We'll probably start with Julia. It'll be like, what is soju to you? Soju, uh, soju to me uh, was obviously, well, for a lot of people's experiences, I think when they first come to Korea is the first drink that somebody pushes into you uh, at a dinner table. So it's a quintessential experience, that green bottle. Um, and it is, it is interesting and it is, it is part of the, the culture here. But to me, it's a whole wide new world uh, of expression, of craft, of, um, of possibility and potential. But I would say you can't really uh, talk about soju without talking about the other cousins, which are part of the process, which is makgeolli and cheongju. Um, the one thing that really got me into Korean alcohol is that the three the three representative categories of Korean alcohol, makgeolli or makgeolli and takju, and cheongju and yakju and soju, they're all intertwined with the same process. So in order to make soju, you have to make cheongju or potentially makgeolli or takju. Um, so it is, for me, uh, very much about the process. It's about the ingredients and it's about um, basically your, your expression on taste and flavor and craft. So it's not just the green bottle. Um, there's so much more to it and it's a it's a very um a very new uh, experience for a lot of people i think thank you very much julia and moving on to mr douglas park what is soju to you well uh well soju is my business so <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah it's a, it's a korean alcohol i think most uh people associate it unfortunately only in like karaoke setting or you know Korean barbecue, um, but as Julia mentioned, uh, there's so much more um, that could be said about soju, um, and that's why we are here today. I think, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's Korean alcohol, um, one of the most widely consumed Korean alcohol. Um, yeah. Thank you very much, Doug. That is what he sold you to Douglas. It's his business, everyone. So he's going to sell it to you. <laughs> and moving, on to, <laughs> moving on to Mr. Damien, Mr. Sean. Gentlemen, what is sold you to you? I think a younger generation, it probably means a lot of things, a lot of cheap nights out, a lot of friends. So what is sold you? Um, sold you to me? Dalutin soju is the best tea for the far that went through all the up and down of my life. <laughs> love hate, I love hate. Love <laughs> relations. <laughs> and uh, this chili soju like Toki is the new kids that we just became friends. This chili soju has many potential, I think, mm -hmm. to change Korean drink culture as a bartender. We need to show how to enjoy the high quality of soju to customer. That's my job. <laughs> For me, what a great soju, job! Yeah, <laughs> I like the word love, 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 love hate relationship. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every time you get drawing, and you're still drinking. You know, <laughs> but you, for me, it's like a, a challenge. I think because. In 2017, when I had a when I had a chance to travel to the US and we like did like bar hopping, like for one month, I've been to like more than 50 bars, 60 bars, and had more than like 300 cocktails. I don't even count. But one thing I noticed is there's no soju bottle in the back bar, like in any of the bar. So at that moment I realized, oh, gotta study this, gotta learn about our culture and get to know it then since then it's been my challenge to introduce like soju to the, to the guests and introduce soju cocktail and make it popular probably global wise hopefully yeah so i think it's a good start to have this kind of conversation with you guys so it's nice <laughs> there you are guys i mean sure i here to bring soju to the world to me, it just means headache in the morning. This tastes great. Uh, so <laughs> diving a little bit into the history of soju, I think Julia sort of mentioned mm -hmm. the sort of products you have to make some of it that comes from 
making soju, we're going to the history of the drinking culture, the soul history, then we'll get a little bit more, then we'll go into production with Douglas. So Julia, I know you started a little bit on the tap juice and your Macaulay's. Can we just dive deep more into kind of the history of soju and how it just became sort of ingrained into Korean culture? Whoa, that's, I mean, how much time do we have for that? Because <laughs> that's a that's a huge part because alcohol has been a big part of Korean history uh, for as long as Korea has been around. Um, but actually there's been a lot of uh, changes and ebbs and flows as to which category was more popular at certain times. And soju being a distillation was introduced via, uh, you know, the Mongol region and, and Mesopotamia as it was invented. Uh, or, and it came down to Korea in that way. But a lot of the alcohol uh, development, basically to, to bring it down of how it's made, it's three ingredients. It's rice, it's water, and it's the fermentation starter unique to Korea called nuruk. Uh, and nuruk is a wild uh, fermentation starter that is uh, inoculated with enzymes and yeast and bacteria and all these things that make the fermentation. They have the enzymatic reaction to make rice into sugar. Uh, and of course, the yeast turn that sugar into alcohol. So the fermented product after it's filtered uh, is something we call wonju. Um, and wonju means original base liquor, which you can drink. It's very strong. It's between you know, 12 and 21 percent. It's delicious. Uh, but if you allow that to settle and separate, uh, the heavy sediment part of the rice actually sinks to the bottom uh, and a golden clear layer appears at the top. So in its essence, you've created two drinks because the golden clear layer can be taken off the top. And this is called Chongju or Yakju. Uh, and then that can be distilled into soju. Uh, but also the bottom milky part, you can mix that up. You can uh, add water to it, which is what we generally consider to be makgeolli. Uh, but it all comes from this one basic uh, fermentation um, uh, reaction between rice water and nuruk. And actually, for when we think about the history, uh, we think of taking it sort of from the Joseon dynasty, which was the most recent uh, dynasty before modern Korea. And at that time, Korean alcohol was not commercially produced. It was uh, outlawed. It was, it was banned to have any kind of commercial uh, production facility. So it was a homebrew technique. So this is something that was passed down from generation to generation, often from the matriarch of the family would pass down these techniques um, from mother to daughter. And it was considered in a lot of the same ways as making kimchi or making gochujang or denjang or all these other kinds of Korean fermentations. Korea, hands down, best country in the world for fermentation. You won't find a better one. Uh, and so over time, those techniques very much became a part of family history and family culture. Um, and so for soju, there's actually a lot of regions, a couple of regions that are quite well known as producing a lot more soju or having more family connection to soju um, because of their regionality. But the, the soju that we have uh, now, that green bottle, um, it's pretty much probably more thrown to the fore in modern times uh, because of challenges post-Korean War. We had no refrigeration, uh, rice famine, lack of ingredients, all these kinds of things. So distillation was favored in terms of uh, shelf stability. Uh, and actually the strength of soju back in the sort of 60s and 70s was in a distillation ABV of a normal 35, 40, 50 percent. Um, whereas now we sort of have two categories. I, I sort of look at it and where we're trying to uh, maybe categorize this in a way that we have table strength soju and we have spirit strength soju. Um, because if you have that green bottle, it's actually pretty low in ABV compared to say vodkas or gins or whiskeys and things like that. And it gets drunk, as you guys were saying, quite high volume. Uh, every dinner table will have a green bottle and you'll drink bottle after bottle. Many people will ask you, how many bottles of soju can you drink? And I'm really curious about you guys' number uh, as to how many bottles of soju you can drink. Um, but that's something, five, there you go. Keith is telling me five. That's a pretty impressive number. Uh, but of course, that's very unusual in a distillation sense. Of sense. So we every year, the, the table strength soju tends to get lower in ABV. And the common ABV right now is sort of between 17 and 25%. Uh, 
Um, but then you have this other category of spirit strength soju, which is, you know, companies like Toki and other kinds of uh, artisan producers that are trying to bring soju out of its history as being, you know, a cheap date or uh, not being something of high quality as being something that could be incorporated into amazing cocktails with a lot of history and a lot of expression, as I was saying before. So it's been quite a journey, but actually soju is in its youth in some ways, uh, in, in terms of its reimagining and its reawakening into these two different categories. Um, and you won't ever change the table strength. It'll be there, you know, at the end of the world, there'll still be a green bottle of soju uh, at every table. But now we've got this opportunity for a whole new category of spirit strength sojus um, that can be put into the world stage uh, up against the best uh, distillates of the world. So that's a very small snapshot. If I had another couple of hours, I'd talk your ear off, but that's that's maybe just a, a glimpse. Thank you very Thank much, you Julia. Wow, I think we're all learning a little bit more about soju than we thought we knew, actually. I've learned a little <laughs> bit in there. Douglas, yes. as a gentleman now, we've gone from sort of your classical and historical facts about soju, we are coming to you now, the modern craft soju that is coming up. The trends, the production methods used these days, are they now differing to the historical? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, right. Um, <laughs> Over to you, Doug. <laughs> yeah, no, um, yeah, it's, it's very different, right? And as Julia hinted, uh, it's, it's good to kind of separate out and view uh, soju into two categories, the mass produced green bottle stuff and the craft um, spirits. The green bottles, the manufacturers of those, they're essentially a bottling company. Um, they don't really distill anything. In fact, um, they source the ethanol, um, put their derivative you know, sweeteners and then they bottle. As for the craft spirits, I mean, it's it's complicated, right? Because essentially, obviously you cook the rice, you know, um, you ferment it and you distill it, but how everyone does it is quite different. And um, especially for us, I think what we wanted to incorporate into the soju making process was the Western science um, and the equipment and the technology. Um, for instance, um, a lot of the craft soju manufacturers um, use vacuum still. still. Um, we, on the other hand, decided to use uh, copper stills, um, very much like uh, in the West, you know, um, whiskey manufacturers or gin manufacturers use. Um, yeah, so, you know, uh, and also, in terms of storage, I think, or fermentation tanks, like for instance, uh, we keep all of our fermentation tanks um, temperature controlled. Obviously that was not possible in the past, but uh, yeah, little things like that, I think um, goes a long way into making a better product. Um, and I, you know, uh, it's, it's, there's a lot to be improved, I think, in general, um, yeah. Also, like uh, I've seen some of the techniques, you know, like the barrel aging and sort of uh, aging sojus coming through. So, like, uh, where do you, is that something that's here to stay, or is it just sort of like a trend, a one-off trend? It, it's it's hard to say. Um, so a lot of Korean sojus, um, they age it in these um, ceramic uh, vessels called ungi, right? Or um, yeah, ungi. But uh, obviously, we don't feel that that does anything um, other than evaporate uh, evaporation. So uh, as you mentioned, um, we have begun um, barrel aging. Uh, it is our opinion that all spirits um, if you look at the highest end um, it's has to do with barrel aging um, whether it be brandies 
you know, uh, whiskey, right? Um, I think large part of that has to do with, you know, the romantic idea of time and alcohol. Um, and uh, yeah, um, I think eventually it'll get there. But um, the interesting th thing to think about um, when you barrel age soju is internationally, um, whiskey is defined as grain that's fermented, distilled, and then barrel aged. Um, rice, as Julia mentioned, is traditionally made with rice, which is also grain. So you kind of get a interesting result in that you could call it whiskey, but is also barely soju. Um, as for us specifically, we decided to uh, call it barely soju because we are a soju company and our mission is to, I guess, elevate um, the Korean category. Um, so yeah, it's, you get an interesting result. I think it will only increase over time, uh, the amount of barrel aging. Um, yeah. Yeah, so Douglas, looking into sort of what you're battling against here, you know, the craft soju. I would hardly call it a battle because... Uh, <laughs> so you have no chance of winning. It's, uh, you know, it's very humbling. <laughs> <laughs> but looking into the market share, you are trying to grab a slice of it. Uh, we got your dummies guide to fun facts about soju, which is 100 million over 100 million cases are consumed per year of soju, 100 million. And of those, how many do you think craft soju are taking at the moment? Uh, well, uh, I don't know about cases, um, but uh, about 30 million, I would say, is the market size in US dollars. Um, Out of a market of $3.5 billion. That's approximately right, yeah. There you are, people. Make soju. <laughs> There's a big market out there. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you very much, Douglas. Uh, moving on to now to Sean and Demi. You know, we have now these craft soldiers coming in, these great producers. You know, it's gone from just being something that's relatively cheap and just like unedible to like this craft spirit and craft product you have. How are you guys now utilizing it in the bars here in Korea? What can you do with the soju? What are you doing with it in your bars? And, you know, where do you see it going now in terms of? movement in, uh, is he ever going to replace vodka for example so good mm -hmm. question Would yeah. You like to start yeah at the bar things have changed a few years ago when korean find a soju cocktail in a menu their reaction was like wait a minute there is soju in there and they were not willing to try because they thought it would be bad and they immediately think of the green bottle when they see the term soju. But after craft soju is introduced to the market, people started to turn their eyes on craft soju and become more open mind to try and discover new things like Turkey soju. <laughs> <laughs> and we see more and more bars at it add soju cocktails on their menu. For example, our good friend, Mr. Lim, uh, the owner of the Chum, have you tried the Chum? Uh, he made a Korean liquor cocktail menu with different craft soju from different reason. You're gonna try that when you find your seven soul. Here at the chest, we also have some soju cocktail. For example, we have CK cocktail which is a milk punch style for those who don't know about shikhe. Shikhe is a traditional Korean rice beverage served as a dessert made with rice, malted belly, and spiced, uh, spices such uh, as uh, ginger and cinnamon. So we use Toki soju as a based with addition of our house spices lum cooked with various spiced and you can try 
I think your cocktail is just tonight. <laughs> tonight. <laughs> tonight. <laughs> we can fly over and <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we are actually using Toki soju right now in our shake cocktail. So it's a super nice. You can definitely try it if you find yourself in Seoul. So yeah, it's it's really funny. It's only been like I think less than five years that people started to turn their eyes on craft soju. So originally like you know, just as Kiss mentioned, still diluted soju is the most common soju you can find in the market. It takes almost like, I would say more than 98% of the entire soju market in Korea. Distilled soju only makes less than like 2% of it, correct? Yeah. yeah. The entire soju market, but it's emerging because diluted soju is, you know, it's so cheap and you can get strong with so little amount of so, so you can drunk with cheaper price, but <laughs> because it has a, such a stimulating taste, it became so natural for people to drink it, you know, at once, you know, you have to shoot it. Every time you drink a soju, you have to make a toast and you shoot it. So people, because people drink soju so fast and get drunk fast, so they don't even think how precious the soju is. So you can see the way Koreans think of soju is exactly reflect in the Korean dramas. You know, think about the scene, there's a bad guy taking a shot of whiskey, a little sword on the rock, in a luxurious bar, chandelier, nice suit, agonizing about something. On the other hand, our hero knocks back his glass of soju <laughs> in a street car, you know, swearing loudly or sobbing, get drunk. <laughs> So that's the common image of soju, isn't it, Julia? Yes. I, can, I, I, can see can I, I love that analogy. That was that was just right on. I've never heard anyone make that parallel before, but it's bang yeah, yeah. on. That was perfect. So, so I've never heard of someone actually appreciate the taste of diluted soju. Hmm. Do you swore soju when you no? When you just shoot it, right? Kids, <laughs> you just shoot it, right? So mm. there's, a, there's actually a saying that in Korea, soju is sweet because life is bitter. That's possible mm. because it's diluted soju. That's exactly the same idea that Korean cuisine should be humble, like, you know, something that is not precious enough to be enjoyed in a luxurious restaurant or bar. So for Korean, soju is like, like Demi says, like an old pal, like a good friend, very humble liquor. You know, mm. but beyond that thinking, there's a no notion that Korean, anything Korean is inferior and shabby, but things have to change. Um, but, you know, a few years ago, when you find yourself in the downtown Korea, you get to see these lines of restaurants, you know, barbecues, Korean pubs. But once you get there, you'll find the same liquor, which is lager beer and a different brand of Dalu Soju. So everyone was selling the same stuff, selling the same culture. People, only a few people had thought about what they're actually drinking or consuming. But after this crap soju has introduced into the market, people, you know, now you see all these different type of Korean restaurants all around the city, even in Apkojong, where our zest is located in. So you see all these Korean restaurants that stocked hundreds of Korean liquors including makgeolli, yakju, and distilled soju, and so forth, which is served with modern style Korean cuisine. So only it took three to five years to we have this change. So it's really amazing to watch this change. So it's, uh, I, I would say it, 2021 is the new era of soju in Korean liquor. Something is happening here. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a really positive change. You know, think about Amaro, or scotch, which once used to be a regional liquor that only regional people, local people enjoy. Now people enjoy it all around the world. So I think soju has a possibility to become a death stairs. So now is the time. <laughs> totally agree. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Now's the time. <laughs> yeah. But you're so right. Can I add to that though? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I I started I started ten years ago. Mm. At that time, you know, in the Makkali world, we talk about artificial sweeteners, aspartame, right? So yeah, there's, yeah, aspartame. you know, 
95, that time probably 99% of all makale contained aspartame as an artificial sweetener. Uh, and mm -hmm. we could count on one hand how many options we had not to have that. Mm -hmm. There were not very many upscale bars. There was not many uh, attractions to even makale as being mm -hmm. a quality drink. And it was, you know, not, not yeah. high ends. Five years ago, I would definitely mm -hmm. say that's that's right on the money for the time when things had to shift. And if for a comment for people that maybe don't know much about Korea, the Korea changes so fast that if mm -hmm. something it, something gets latched on, it's going to change much faster than anywhere else in the world. And in Australia, nothing changes very quickly. So uh, I notice this very quickly. Um, so I, I think that, you know, this 2020 being the 2021 being the time is right, because we are now actually becoming awash with uh, good quality makalis, good quality yakjus and chongjus and now sojus, that Absolutely. the Korean domestic market is just exploding. Mm. Um, yeah. Even in the last two years, I think it was two years ago where they said 46 new uh, makali breweries opened in one year. Mm. When previous to that, it was maybe, I don't know, two or three that were actually attempting crafts. Um, mm. So we are seeing a huge industry change uh, in terms of popularity and can I say age? <laughs> uh, because a lot of the producers and a lot of the people that were the players 10 years ago were older generation. They were second career yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, people. Now we're seeing youth. We're seeing people that want to own mm. bars. We're seeing people that want to make breweries and, and distilleries. So this injection of a different perspective uh, in terms of marketing and, and um, product quality and all that sort of stuff. It's, yeah, it's changing. It's, it's whiplash. <laughs> it's hard to keep up with all the things that are happening. So it's very yeah. exciting right now. Here's a question from Julia and Sean. You know, we're talking about, almost like talking about terroir in terms of soju. Will soju ever become something like a tequila where it just suddenly kind of becomes the next big thing? Like mezcal is having a moment at the moment. So do you reckon craft soju, same to you, Doug, is going to get there? Oh, I, I actually, uh, just before COVID, uh, I was preparing to start an export company, actually, um, for soju, for quality craft soju. And I, I will say that we used mezcal as a model, as a, as a potential model, because I do see a lot of parallels with the industry here and with um, the potential for it to access markets overseas. Um, I think the drink itself has so much potential, but there are a lot of barriers domestically um, with the existing distillation producers. Um, and that's things like language, that's things like uh, marketability, and I'll be honest, price. Um, one of the problems that we do have with a lot of the producers is to understand uh, wholesale and taxes and all those sort of things overseas. So while I think that it is absolutely possible that it could explode, there's a lot of things that we have to fix domestically uh, amongst um, you know, the potential uh, to, to actually make that a reality. But uh, I mean, I'm putting my eggs in that basket. So I think 100%, I think uh, mezcal is a good model and also Baijiu is a good model. Chinese Baijiu is also having quite uh, penetrative access around international markets that I think Soju also can, uh, can benefit. But as long as it has that image restructure because even overseas that green bottle people say oh i know soju um but actually no you know green bottle soju you don't know the whole other side of of craft soju so we firmly believe that any success overseas is uh 100 tied to education um that's in terms of promotions and marketing and pop-ups and all that sort of stuff that really brings your your customer and consumer in rather than just sending a product um and hoping that it is successful so yes i think it is possible but there's a lot of work to do i think i i completely agree with uh julia in that um domestically there are a lot of issues that need to be fixed before um i think create uh Korean alcohol in general uh, could kind of take the world stage. Um, a lot of the tax structures, unfortunately, alcohol, I think worldwide is one of the most regulated industries and uh, the tax structure in Korea is tax structure and laws are very archaic. Um, they haven't updated in a while. And while there have been efforts um, to um, make it easier for uh, smaller producers. 
but most of the laws are still geared towards the heavyweights in the industry. For instance, um, if you want to build a distillery, uh, you need, I, I think it was 150,000 liter capacity uh, of vessels, whether it be, you know, um, fermentation tanks or whatnot, before you could even get a license. Um, now, the issue with that, obviously, is that when you're starting out a distillery, how can you have that big of a capacity, right? Um, so there's a lot of barrier of entry um, for uh, creating more diverse um, and products. Uh, but um, yeah, I think eventually, I think uh, it could get there. And even, you know, we now see, including ourselves, I mean, we started in Brooklyn, right? Um, we see other soju producers being um, popping up, uh, whether it be in Europe or Canada. Um, there are a few more, actually, um, good friends of ours in the States. Uh, so, yeah, like if more producers pop up like that, I think it could um, become a main, like, major category, right? Uh, what's interesting is soju um, is not region specific uh, in terms of classification. So um, more producers that are popping up internationally definitely will help um, creating uh, the image, the new image of soju. Yeah, we totally agree. I think so. I think it was a great idea to bring Toki Soju back to Korea, even though you started in New York, because I think it starts from changing the perception of Koreans, what they're thinking about Soju from domestic market, and then we jump to the foreign market, because we, we, we don't know, we, we, we don't know like what exactly Soju is, how can we sell, and how can we like, ask other people to drink more social. So I think that's a great start that you brought the Tokyo brand. So I think there's a starting point. That's a starting point. Hmm. So they uh, <laughs> request <laughs> agave <laughs> and drink more soju, yes. To everyone <laughs> around the world. <laughs> so it gets me to, you know, with the Korean culture at the moment being extremely trendy you know, the K-pop and a lot of the films winning a lot of Oscars. You know, Korea is having a moment in the world at the moment. Where do we see Soju going then? Is it gonna become a trend then sort of go back down or is it something that's here to stay? And how can we capitalize on what's happening with Korea being in the limelight at the moment? You know, it's like, how can we push the products to be like, this is what we, is happening in Korea. We are making this soju. This is a great product. Yes, there is a green bottle, but that green bottle is not actually showing the quality that's being what's happening here. So where do we see the future for soju? Where is it going? So anyone can just jump on on that one. I think internationally, uh, it has to be, I mean, as we said, I mean, this, this has to be after we fix our domestic issues uh, or, or if there are more uh, players overseas that, that open up and contribute to, to the, the industry. But it has to be a collaborative effect. I think you're, you're very right. And we talk about it quite a lot. That Korea's moment is available now for lots of industries uh, because people are not necessarily fans of K-pop or, or, you know, that you have to be a BTS fan to love Soju. Um, it's just that people's awareness of Korea is much more elevated now um, just by, you know, listening to the news and just knowing where, that Korea exists, that this is a different, a different category of awareness, I think. Um, but I think part of that movement is also going to be happening in Korean cuisine. Uh, the Korean food industry is also making leaps and strides in terms of not just the dishes themselves, I think the dishes absolutely, but as fermentation as a whole, and this, this plays into a global trend, 
um, that fermentation is in terms of alcohol, yes, but also in food, uh, fermentation for gut health, for, um, you know, for healthy living and all that slow lifestyles, all that sort of stuff. So again, Korea's uh, abilities for kimchi, for gochujang and all those things, chefs around the world that may not even make Korean pay, uh, Korean uh, dishes are looking to source things like gochujang or, or duenjang and things like that. So there is a more, uh, I guess, permeable uh, influence of Korea's cuisine, Korea's cultural uh, power and things like that. So having, and to answer your question, you know, is it a, is it a fad or is it not? We've already seen the fans. Uh, if you guys were talking about the cocktails before, those blue, you know, weird Yakult co cocktails and all that sort of stuff that's not really a cocktail. Uh, so now really the future is investing in quality. And quality, in my opinion, always pays off. Um, it's just a matter of how you put your ducks in a row. Um, so I think we have an opportunity not to piggyback off, um, you know, K-pop and the, the rise of BTS and Oscars and all that sort of stuff, but to smartly uh, be aware that there's more opportunity for people to have a peaked interest in what is Korea. And then we can introduce them to all these other things that may be um, to their tastes. So it's an opportunity. Korea is having a unique time right now. So timing is everything. Um, so hopefully Hopefully, I mean, fingers crossed, but we'll see. As for me, um, I think, uh, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't see how piggybacking on things like K-pop or even Korean cuisine sometimes. Unfortunately, um, a lot of high-end Korean restaurants um, pair their food with wine. Uh, I guess it's inevitable. But uh, that's what happens usually. So I see actually Korean spirits um, kind of doing their own thing, uh, going into the future. Um, I think it's important to, you know, I mean, we, so give you an example, right? Um, we've had offers from like Korean celebrities to invest in our company. Um, the reason why we turned it down is because we didn't want to have our products image rely on that celebrity, right? Um, mm. I think, uh, I think I could say for the most part that uh, the power of alcohol is that it outlasts any trend or fad, right? Um, if you look at any product, any alcoholic product, right? It, it just outlasts any trend or fad. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, it's here to stay um, and it's only gonna get interest more interesting. Um, that 30 million that I told you, uh, I hope that it grows uh, much more. Um, and I think I know that it will because if you look at things like craft beer, for instance, in the States, you you know, trace back 20 years ago, there weren't that many, but now there are a bunch of them. So um, I think the key is uh, to, either one um, let you know ease up on the regulation here in uh, Korea uh, for um, a lot of other smaller produce, producers to have equal chance and um, or uh, have a lot of more international players play into uh, the soju category right um, as far as I know uh, no major um, international, uh, alcoholic uh, conglomerate owns uh, a soju brand. And I think that once, like for instance, big heavyweights like Diageo gets interested in it, I think that has a big potential in making it uh, more internationally recognized spirit. Those are the good point. And um, talking about the the way of changing the concrete perception of Korean people, as soju is you know old and boring, and soju is like shabby. Because now we bring this kind of crap soju in the market, and more and more players jump to the market. I think the the biggest change of the I would say old fashioned soju and a new uh, new fashion soju is the way they deliver 
they, the way they introduce the item. So like, you know, if you see the old soldier bottle, like we, we actually, we always had such an artisanal microbreweries, artisanal soju makers, like we call it Changin, which is like artisan. But if, when you see the package, you know, like for like new, like young, younger generation, the people who actually turn their eye on the craft soju, they think it's kind of boring. So now they put a lot of effort to change the level as well. And the, the mark, their marketing, so now we actually even have a like a subscription, you know, the the you know you, you, you get monthly delivery of soju and other makgeollis at your home. So it, it's really fun to watch that things have changed. So soju can so that I think that's the way to change the perception of soju, you know, try new things, you know, keep up with the uh, the the trend. So yeah, I think that's the one thing to think about how we actually get to, how we get this soju to the actual mainstream. Thank you, Sean. And I think I'm about to go into a question which uh, I think Doug stepped into kind of the regulations. Mm. You know, we are going into sort of the last period here. Should then soju start having certifications or Korean alcohol, because I know there's a lot of soju being made everywhere. Like anything, like you said, can almost be a soju, like a whiskey that's not being aged. So is having a certification something that could even elevate sort of the, you know, separate the riffraff into the actual kind of people doing a great craft soju and the big boys who are not actually producing anything it can just be, you know, ethno with a little bit of sweetener. And that would leave then soju as a category that's actually have a little bit more respect. So should soju have a certification basically? Um, that's, a, that's a very complicated question. Um, I think that, I hate to cop out, but it's yes and no, right? Um, because um, I believe that it will help in that, um, It will help because it will allow the craft um, spirits, uh, the craft sojus to stand out more um, and have their own category, but it's hard to change the perception of the green bottle stuff, right? Um, everyone already calls it soju. So it's, 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 I don't know if a certification will ever change that fact, you know? Um, and I don't see how, even if, for instance, the green bottle stuff, let's just say it's actually closer to vodka. So, you know, like, let's just say you can't call this soju. Even if that was put into place uh, legally, I think people will still call it soju, right? Mm -hmm because of just habitual reasons. Um, so I don't know. Um, if there is a, and if you actually, and Julia could probably add to this, but if you actually look at the historic definition of soju, it's also ambiguous, right? It's just, you know, pretty much it translates to just distilled alcohol. So. Um, I don't know how we should define it specifically. Um, you know, obviously there are cases like, you know, uh, tequila or, you know, uh, cognac, right? That's region specific. I don't know if that's the answer either. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's just, I think at this point, um, maybe adding another certificate, uh, while it will help some, but like, Companies like our company, who's trying to um, compete internationally, I, I don't think it really matters to us. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts, Julia? Yeah, it's an interesting one, actually. Uh, this mm. conversation actually is already happening in the industry a little bit. Mm. But the, the one thing that will always come up is there is a whole category of soju producers that are traditional soju producers. 
Um, so that means that there's already an internal argument about what is traditional and what category what it uh, what can be categorized as traditional. So for the rules to change for them, uh, it's mostly about their access and their tax and what they are able to do. There's the really controversial argument right now that's happening in terms of what is classified as chontongju, which is traditional alcohol. Um, because if you're classified as chontongju in or tuksanju in in Korea. It means you can sell online. It means that you have access to a B2C market um, in all of the shopping platforms and things like that. So that's a big thing. But if you look at some of the producers that are uh, classified as Chontongju or, or Tuksanju, they're not Soju or they're not uh, different kinds of classifiers of alcohol. So again, this is something that the Korean domestic industry uh, doesn't have a clear leader, I guess, in terms of, uh, or a clear consensus. I think the hardest thing that you'll ever get uh, in terms of getting a new category or a new certificate is a consensus. And then who has the right to make that consensus? Who are the players that make up that consensus? Um, and we have similar issues with, you know, we don't really even have a, a national sommelier test for Korea, Korean alcohol. We have competitions and we have individual sommelier, um, you know, uh, courses and things like that from different schools, but we still don't have a tasting rubric that is, uh, that is nationally defined. Um, so I think, whether or not it changed, and the other thing, which I love that you said, I don't think it's going to change people's minds about soju. Even if it existed, it might be a, in, a domestic or an industry change. But for the consumer, what I've always found very fascinating is that soju is a unique category of alcohol where if I said soju to just about every Korean person, they instantly think of one brand. Um, so the category is intrinsically tied to one brand. And that's almost unheard of in, in terms of the world. It's like saying, you know, I, I say beer and you think, you know, Budweiser or something like that. Like it's cola. It, <laughs> cola. <laughs> yes, cola. No, you're dead on. Yeah, no, I take yeah. it back. <laughs> um, but that's that's a that's a big challenge. So would a certificate change that? Would any kind of uh thing change? I don't think so. But what maybe for internationally would be better recognized, and I do think that this is important, is that there should be a baseline at least in terms of it should be made of rice, whether it uses enzymes or nuruk or something like that, but at the very least it should be made of rice. Um, so a rubric or frame. And there we actually investigated, there is an international body that states what soju is, um, and it's uh, actually the domestic product that is most common here does not fulfill those requirements anymore. Um, has that changed people's perceptions of soju? Absolutely not. Um, but will it maybe have a standardization around the world of what can be called soju? Um, and the only reason I mentioned this is that we do see instances internationally where shochu producers, um, which is distilled sake, uh, are calling it soju. Um, because they actually come from the same Chinese character as 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 burned liquor. Su meaning to burn and chu meaning alcohol. Shu chu is the same thing. Um, so it, because soju is easier spelled uh, and easier to pronounce internationally, uh, and it's easier to market, there have been producers overseas that have called shochu soju and interchangeably. So I would say internationally, a certificate might help. Uh, in terms of just keeping everyone on an even keel, would it work in Korea? Mm, I don't think so. And I don't know if it really would impact the industry very much. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my thoughts on it. And for Sean and Demi, as sort of like on trade, you guys are using a lot of the soju and a lot of the product. Will it ever yeah, sort of overtake vodka, for example, on your bath bar? So, you know. Are we at the level where soju can pretty much compete against the big brands on the back bar here in your craft cocktail bars? I mean, it would take a long time to, <laughs> I mean, I mean, nah, it doesn't need to, soju doesn't need to replace vodka. I mean, what we want is to, every liquor from all around the world, like scotch, vodka, gin, and we add a soju in there <laughs> to, at every like or equal position so that's i think that's our goal to make soju to put soju in people's perception but i think right there's one way that we doing in zest is we actually do not have any bottle displayed in the back bar 
So <laughs> when you go to a bar, you see all these different types of bottles from all around the world, but we don't have any bottles except the RTD bottle we made and uh, the pre batch cocktails that we made. So other than that, we don't, we don't see any bottles. So one of the reasons we want to make, we want to give equal chance of every spirit to be introduced to the guest. So like, you know, like Demi said, like three years ago, like when people find soju in a menu, they, you know, they just instantly reject to have that drink. Now we don't, you know, we gave the ingredient as a flavor wise. And then when people order a drink and then, oh, people get shocked and oh, what's in it? And then we tell them there's soju in there. And then now they get even shocked, you know, because they thought, this is not the taste they would expect from soju. So by, so right now we actually have three, more than three, three cocktails out of like 15. So we are using soju in our cocktail. So that's a lot of percentage of the, in terms of entire menu. So like, you know, think of three whiskey cocktail, three gin cocktails, like two tequilas and three soju that's uh, Less of amount because we have to cover all these spirits from all around the world. So we're giving soju equal chance to, you know, to compete. I would say with other uh, world worldwide spirit. So yeah, that's what what you're doing here. <laughs> so just okay. wrapping yeah. up now, no, guys. No, one last thing: no, What no, do you no, want no, the world no, to know no. about soju? Just quick and brief. Julia, you're up. It's a brand new category. Get interested in it and get into it. Uh, it's, you know, there's so much, there's so much of, uh, potential for you to find what you want to express yourself through it. Um, and it is, as, as Doug was saying, it is, you know, it's blue ocean in a lot of ways. Um, and we need more producers. We need more people that are uh, creating an industry. One man can't do it alone. Um, so I say, just, you know, forget the, enjoy the green bottle. Cause we all do, let's be honest. Um, but, but get interested into a whole different world. Um, and don't forget all the other categories. Don't forget makgeolli and don't forget, uh, Chongju and Yakju. Korean alcohol, uh, I do really think is going to be, um, a force to be reckoned with, a force to be reckoned with. Douglas. Uh, Keith, all these hard questions, man. <laughs> man, what do I want people to know about soju? Uh, well, um, hmm. Oh, are about Korea. I think, I th I think uh, what I want people to know about soju is that there's more to it than just green bottle stuff, right? And the usual context in which you drink soju, right? Which is karaoke, Korean barbecue. It could be taken out of that context. I think um, it could be used uh, like Zest does, you know, uh, in a cocktail program. Uh, it has more potential um, than the tiny box it plays in right now. Um, so yeah, give it a chance. Um, and even if you don't like it, just like any other category, there are lots of producers. So, you know, Give it a chance. Sean and Demi. So at the moment, you pro probably don't have many producers, you can many brands you can find in overseas, I mean, out of Korea, because the change is happening in Korea right now. But because of COVID, we cannot, you know, share this beauty, share this, you know, share, share this um, experience but if you ever find a soju or if you ever have a friend who visits korea asks then uh bring a bottle of good stuff soju good quality soju and if they if they don't know what they have with but what they're going to purchase just just let us know just you know <laughs> visit their instagram and just dm us like we, we can give or or ask doug ask julia they can give recommendations yeah is it always yeah. There you are. There are. <laughs> a new category with a lot of history and tradition behind it. Just remember, soju is sweet because life is bitter. <laughs> Ciao, guys. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Ciao. <laughs> <laughs>